Stay tuned for Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The setting on your dial is the passport to a shadow land of mystery and terror. And you can travel as far and as long as your imagination will permit. In ancient times, evil was usually the work of people who were monstrous, grotesque, and psychotic. Today's perpetrators, for the most part, are quite banal. Many of them lead what can only be described as normal lives. Some of them have achieved such heights of respectability that their deeds are no longer considered evil. No, for the good old days when villains were villains and performed with style and flair. Today's faceless scoundrels don't even get any fun out of their own evil. Our mystery drama, Killer of the Year, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and imported Vina Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Evil. What's evil? Since the beginning of the human race, men have speculated on the nature of evil. Saints, philosophers, psychologists, all have deliberated, and still, the answer eludes us. In this enlightened century, will science finally solve the problem? Shall we discover that evil is actually a virus, a disease that infects its victims at random? Impossible, you say? Perhaps. But how do you account for the fact that so many people are suddenly stricken? So many of the most unlikely people. People like Harry Johnson. Turn around, Harry. Let me look at you. Oh, no, dear. The gold cufflinks. Well, that's too formal. Well, it's a formal occasion. All right. Who rang the bell before? Oh, it was a telegram. The president of your own company, Mr. G.G. G. Gresham himself. Well, what do you think of that? I don't know. What am I supposed to think of it? Well, don't you even want to read it? Oh, you read it. Oh, all right. Congratulations. You are a credit to the corporation. Signed, G.G. G. Gresham. Ah. Oh. Well? Well, what? Do you realize what this means? Mr. Gresham himself, all the way out in Chicago. Mr. Gresham, who personally runs a half-billion-dollar corporation, knows about you, knows about the award, and is personal... Mr. Gresham has a PR department which handles this kind of nonsense. Oh, why do you call it nonsense? Because he couldn't care less. I beg to differ, Harry, when one of his executives... To him, I'm an employee. ...wins the Man of the Year Award. In a tank town like Danvers Corners. This happens to be the county seat, and it's the third largest city in the state. Hey, let's hear it for Danvers Corners. Oh, don't pretend to be cynical, Harry, because you're not. My dear... I never set out to win this award. I mean, it, but it wasn't deliberate. I didn't plan it. It wasn't part of a campaign to do myself some good. Well, it's recognition of the fact I'm that you... I'm not after recognition. I like to work on community projects. I think it's the best investment of time I can make. Darling, when you took me home from our very first date, Mother came upstairs to my room for a chat. That was another world in those days, wasn't it? Oh, it certainly was. And, and Mother said, Tell me all about him, dear. And I did. And she said, you know, he sounds too good to be true. And Harry, she was right. And she still is. You are too good to be true. Oh, come on. I'm the same as everyone else. No, dear, you're not like everyone else. You have a conscience and you have ideals. And those things are in short supply today. <sighs> you know, Jenny, I think I have a headache. A headache? Why should you have a headache all of a sudden? Oh, I think my halo is on too tight. Oh, oh. Come on, we'll be late for the bash. <laughs> Man of the year, buddy. This is the first chance I've had to offer my congratulations. Thank you, Pete. Great dinner. Great speech. Listen, why don't you run for Congress? Now, why should I run for Congress? Why else have you been knocking yourself out three and four nights a week? Because I like it. You mean it's all going to wait? It's not going to wind up doing you any good? Well, it makes me feel good. <laughs> you know... Coming from anyone else, it would sound like a line, but you, I believe. Hello, Pete. Jenny, congratulations. Oh, thank you, Pete. Harry, 
Have you met Wilma Sloan? Wilma Sloan? No, I don't think so. Oh, are you in for a treat? Although, uh... Although what? You're so thoroughly married, you probably couldn't enjoy the sight of another beautiful woman. <laughs> I'll introduce you, dear. Confident Jenny. <laughs> Who is she? Well, she's a new librarian. And she'll be very happy to meet you. Oh, why? Well, she can thank you for her job. After all, dear, you're the one who raised the funds for the library campaign. Come on, you make it sound as if I did it single-handed. Wilma, I'd like you to meet my husband, Harry Johnson. How do you do? Wilma. Wilma Sloan? No, that isn't your name. You're not Wilma Sloan. I know you. That is... Well, I know your face. How could I ever forget your face? I stared at it for hours in that courtroom. I know your face from every angle. There were times when your eyes would wander among the rows of spectators. And sometimes... Sometimes they would meet mine. And we would look at each other for a brief moment. Do you recognize me? Do you know my face? How long was it? Four? No. Five years ago. The company had sent me way, way up and out to the northwest, to a place called Centerville. Centerville. It makes Danvers Corner seem like Paris. Centerville. Uh, Got to be with us a spell, Mr. Johnson. Oh, ten days, two weeks, I suppose. You from the Gresham Company? Uh, yes, I have to run some sales training sessions. But uh, I'll be at night. Uh, tell me, what's there to do around here in the daytime? <laughs> Well, to tell the truth, there ain't nothing to do around here daytimes outside of hunting season. But you're in luck. Why? We got us a murder trial going. A murder trial? Yep. It's in all the papers. Well, the papers around here, I guess. Uh, where's the trial being held? Well, in the courthouse. Where else? I'm fixing to go myself. I'll get the wife to take over the front desk. I'll drive you down there. <laughs> That's her. She? She's the defendant? That's her. Tessie Bonner. She works in the library. Uh, maybe I should say she worked in the library. Well, she, she's a very beautiful woman. Yep. She's good looking. But she's a killer. Well, isn't that what the jury's supposed to decide? <laughs> the jury's already decided. I know every one of them in that box. I can tell. But that's not right. You just listen to the testimony. You'll see. It'll prove she's guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt. State your full name, please. Mrs. Edna Coyne. Well, I guess my full name would be Edna Amaryllis Coyne. Mm -hmm. And you rented an apartment to the defendant, Miss Teresa Bonner. Yes, sir. A three-year lease. And the deceased. Was he a regular visitor? Oh, yes, indeed. He'd show up there two, three, sometimes four times a week. I said to my oldest girl, looks like we have a little love nest up there in 3G. And she said, oh, Ma, get with it. This is the new morality. I mean, so what do you prove if you have a document? Well, I was going to tell her. Uh, did you ever hear signs of an altercation? A what? Arguments. Fight. Oh, no. No, I can't say that I did. I, I didn't hear a word until that night. Now then, suppose you tell us just exactly what you heard. Well, I I was surprised. Surprised? Why? Well, you know, they were very quiet, usually. And all of a sudden, uh, on this particular night, they start yelling at each other. Yelling? Well, maybe not yelling, but you could hear them all right. And he was saying, it's over. It has come to an end. And she kept saying, no, it's not over. It's just begun. She said, I can't. I won't let you walk out on me. And he said, we both knew it would have to end sometime. And she said, it can only end when one of us is dead. And he said, don't be stupid. And she said, I won't let you go. I can't let you go. And he said, you knew from the start I was married. And she said, yes, and so did you. And, 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 and... Yes, Miss Coyne. Well, she said, if I can't have you, she can't have you either. And what did he say to that? He said, be sensible. And, and she said, how can a woman in love be sensible? And, and then the next thing I heard him say was, you're crazy. You've gone mad. Put down that night. You heard him say those exact words. 
put down that knife. Yes, sir. And then what happened? And then I, uh, well, I, I heard him yell. And then? And then I didn't hear anything. Well, I was scared, you know. I, I, I mean, I, I didn't know what to think. What did you do? Well, I thought for a minute. Uh, then I uh, walked up the stairs, and, and I went to her door. Mm, yes. And I, I just stood there listening. Finally, I, I, I knocked on the door, and, and I said, Miss Bonner, uh, Miss Bonner, are you okay? There was no answer. Well, I, I, I tried to turn the handle. The door wasn't locked. So I opened it, and I walked right into the apartment. And there I saw... Would you tell us what you saw? I... I saw him lying on the floor. He was dead. You're sure he was dead? Oh, yes. His chest was covered with blood. And where was the defendant? She was standing there near him, right in the middle of the room. And she was holding a big knife in her hand. And you could see blood on the blade. Would that be that large knife lying on the table marked Exhibit B? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, that's the knife. And and, and she was holding that that, that knife in her hand. And she was mumbling, no one else can ever have you. No one else can ever have you. Mm -hmm. And what you told us just now is exactly what you saw... Yes, sir. Exactly. I have no further questions. And through it all, she sat quietly at her table, next to her attorney. It was as if someone else were on trial. She hardly seemed to listen to anything that was being said. Occasionally, she would glance at the spectators. Her eyes would slowly sweep the room. From time to time, they would meet mine. And she would look at me. Oh, what a... Was it my imagination? But the trial came to an end finally. The jury left the room at 11.45 and returned promptly at 2. They had lunch between 12 and 1.30. So you can imagine how long they deliberated. But, of course, the verdict was obvious from the very outset. Guilty. Guilty of murder in the first degree. Guilty with no recommendation for mercy. So, so now, what is she doing here? Less than five years later. Because, because this is Tessie Bonner. She may call herself Wilma Sloan, but her name is Tessie Bonner. Harry, this is Wilma Sloan. How do you do? Congratulations, Mr. Johnson. Wilma, you said I could have the next dance. How are you at keeping promises? I never broke one yet. Now, if you good people will excuse us. Uh Ah. They make a handsome couple, don't they, Harry? Oh, hmm? uh, what? I said Pete and Wilma Sloan make a good-looking couple, don't they? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, she's such a beautiful girl, isn't she? Yes. Yes, Jenny. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. If you like a girl who knows how to use a knife. But is she the same one? Harry is absolutely certain. But if she's the same one, what indeed is she doing here? The state where she was tried still has the death penalty. At the very least, she should be in jail for a long, long time. Well, you'll only have to wait a short, short time till I return with some answers in Act Two. Although Harry Johnson has raised considerable funds for the town library, he rarely goes there himself. However, this afternoon, on an impulse, one that he cannot explain, or can he, he has stopped at the library. From the doorway, he regards the librarian, a rather beautiful young woman named Wilma Sloan. She's talking to several children. It's hard to believe that she is a woman who, in a fit of passion, or as a result of a cold-blooded resolve, stabbed her lover to death. But she did some five years ago, in a state a thousand miles away. And she has been tried and convicted for murder. And the question is, what is she doing here? Harry Johnson wants to know the answer, but evidently not now. 
And so he turns away and walks down the library steps to the street. Harry! Harry, want a lift? Sure thing. Thanks, Pete. You know, if anybody would ask me where they could find Harry Johnson, I'd answer try the library. Just what's that supposed to mean, Pete? Don't have an affair with her, Harry. What? You heard me. Don't have an affair with whom? With Wilma Sloan. Oh, come on, Pete. What's gotten into you? The problem is not what's gotten into me, but what's gotten into you. Pete, you're either crazy or... Or what? Or... Well, I don't know. Look, what are you driving at? What I'm driving at is that man is not naturally monogamous. Oh, let's not start this nonsense That's again. why I never got married. You may be deeply in love with a woman, but suddenly someone happens along and... And what? And you're gone. I think that's ridiculous. It probably is. But unfortunately, it happens. And it happened to you last night. Pete, I wish you would tell me what you're talking I'm about. talking about Wilma Sloan. What about Wilma Sloan? Well, let's do it in steps, huh? Last night, you were introduced to her. One look at your face convinced me. Convinced you of what? Convinced me I'd better ask her to dance so I could get her away from you. <laughs> and have her for yourself. Oh, no, don't get me wrong. I'd take her if I could get her. But she's not for me. I know. See, I'm an expert in these affairs. Oh, so modest. Look, you may disapprove of my attitude toward life and love. But I do have both experience and expertise. So I took her away from where you and Jenny were standing before... Before what? Before what you were thinking. Before that look on your face could become obvious to everyone else, including my poor dear sister. You know, I think that you are crazy. Yeah, yeah. And so now, it's the afternoon of the next day. The late afternoon. I'm downtown. I stopped for a traffic light. Idly, I glanced toward the library steps, thinking, of course, of that delectable new librarian. When who do I see walking up the steps? Why, my most faithful brother-in-law, Harry. A man whose rectitude has just earned him the Man of the Year award here in Danvers Corners. Oh, I can explain that. But I can explain it better. You walked up the steps. You paused. You're new at this business. You don't quite know how to go about it. So at the last minute, you lost your nerve and beat a hasty retreat. But, Pete, not one word of what you say is true. But you'll come back again. There always has to be a first time, Harry. And your first time is waiting in the wings. Or I should say, behind the desk. Harry, don't do it. I have no intention of... You do. think you don't. Pete, if you don't mind, I insist that we change the subject. Why? Is it so painful? No, it's ridiculous. Then why are you becoming so excited? I'm not excited. But what are you? Uh, Pete, look, uh, I'm very much in love with my wife. Your kind of guy needs watching. Well, don't judge everybody's morality by your own. What were you doing at the library? I thought I needed a certain book. And then, well, then I I remembered that I had it in the house. Sure, It's sure. true. Do you know what Nero said about truth? He said the truth is whatever you want it to be. I must say you choose a strange model. But that's where you are right now, Harry. And don't say I didn't warn you. Hello, Centerville Motel. Uh, yes, uh, this is Mr. Harry Johnson. You wouldn't remember me. I was out there five years ago. I remember you fine, Mr. Johnson. You were with the Gresham Corporation. You spent uh, 15 days here teaching sales seminars. You was in room 112, facing the lake. Uh, yes, well, I may have to take a trip out there, and I wanted to know if the... Uh, well, if the motel was still around... Oh, we're bigger and better than ever. Want me to make you a reservation? Well, my plans aren't firm yet. Why, sure, just give us a little notice. We always got room for you, Mr. Johnson. Yes. Uh, I remember um, when I was out there, uh, you uh, you had some excitement. Excitement? Here? Yes, you were having a, a trial, weren't you? A trial? Oh, oh yeah. Tessie Bonner. Uh, that's who it was. Yes. I, I remember I was in the courtroom when the jury brought in a guilty verdict. Oh, yes. That they did. Now, I wasn't there when the judge sentenced her. Uh, tell me, what did she get? The rope. Uh, but then the governor said, uh, Oh, come on, you can't hang a woman. So he gave her life instead. Oh. Well, I guess she's uh, still in jail. No, no, she's dead. Dead? But I, I say dead. That's the only way to figure Oh, well, then why do you say that she's dead? Well, they made it up to the mountains, but uh, they got caught in a snowstorm. And I guarantee you nobody could live through that one. Well, it's been nice talking to you, 
here, Mr. Johnson. You come up and see us real soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi. Oh. oh, hello, dear. Oh, I thought I heard someone come in the back door. I wanted to make sure it was you. Oh, I, I saw a whole line of cars parked in front of the house, and then I remembered it's your uh, women's club afternoon. Oh, we're just breaking up now. I didn't want to disturb anyone, so I just uh, sneaked up the rear staircase. Oh, that's hardly a word you use in your own house. Sneak. Incidentally, what are you doing home so early? I, uh, well, I, uh, uh, Jenny, I have a problem. I, I just want to, you know, sit and think it out. Oh, sounds grim. Uh, it probably is. What's it about? Well, well, it's concerned with the duties of a citizen. Uh-huh. Well, let me know how it works out. Oh, darling, would you mind doing something for me? You name it. Wilma Sloan is here, and she doesn't have her car, and nobody else is going her way. Oh, Wilma Sloan. You remember, you met her the other night at your award dinner. Darling, would you mind giving her a lift home? Would I mind? Well, I'd do it myself, except I've got to get dinner started. This is very kind of you, Mr. Johnson. I, uh, I'd rather you called me Harry. I will on one condition. You must call me Wilma. Well, I'll do better than that. I'll call you... Or Teresa. Or Miss Bonner. Which do you prefer? I see. Well, what do we do now? I know what I should do. And what's that? Head for the police station and turn you over to the authorities. Why? Because you're an escaped convict. I know, I know I'm an escaped convict, but why should you turn me over to the police? Why? Because it's my duty as a citizen. Oh. And you always do your duty as a citizen? I try to. At least to the best of my ability. And as you see it, it's your duty to return me to the penitentiary. Yes. Why? I never did you any harm. I killed a man who needed killing. You can't kill another human because you want to. What else was I to do? He used me and then he tossed me aside as if I were an object of no consequence. What kind of society would we have if people were free to kill at their own pleasure? You haven't answered my question. Which is, what do we do now? I... I should turn you over to the police. I know you said that. Is this the road to the police station? No. Why aren't we headed that way? Because... Yes. It's clear. It's very clear to me. What do you mean it's very clear to you? How could it be very clear when it isn't clear to me? I don't even know what I'm doing or why. In the interest of clarity... Why do you hesitate to do your duty? Would you hesitate for a moment if I were a man? I don't think so. Again, would you hesitate if I were old, ugly? Oh, no, no, that's... That's, that, that's what? Why do you hesitate? I heard you speak at the banquet the other night. The fabric of society is woven by each single individual and so forth. I recognized you. I remembered you from the courtroom. You... You did? Oh, yes. And I said to myself, Uh-oh, if he remembers me, I'm gone. This is Mr. Pillar of the community himself in the flesh. I should turn you in. I should. But you won't. How do you know? Because you want me. Oh, come on. That's what... Of course it is, but... You want me. And you're saying to yourself, Here's the most attractive woman... I ever met. You have an extremely high opinion of yourself. I must be the most attractive woman you ever met. Do you know why? Because I'm making you go against the habits of a lifetime. I haven't done anything yet. Oh, yes, you have. You're thinking what a waste it would be to send her back to prison. You're not interrupting me now, are you? You're 40 years old. You never stepped out of line in your life. Aren't you bored with Jenny? I'm afraid you don't know everything. Oh, I admit I was tempted for a moment. You should be. I made you quite an offer. Offer? What offer? Myself. What? You would sell yourself to buy my silence? Most women sell themselves for something. That isn't true. They sell themselves for security, for advancement, for the illusion of romance. For me right now, there is nothing more valuable in all the world than your silence. 
Well, it's not for sale. Why not? Not so that I could engage in a... in a tawdry affair. Oh, I see. It's not that you're opposed to an affair. Just a tawdry affair. But always be tawdry. Because... It's not how these things begin. It's what they become. Both of us are attractive. Intelligent. In a week. A month. We would love each other. I love my wife. Then why aren't we headed toward the police station? We are. It's about three miles to the station house. And it should take four or five minutes to get there. An awful lot can take place in four or five minutes. Will she simply submit quietly and return to a sentence of life in prison? After all, she got in there because she killed one man. Would she kill another man to stay out? From a different perspective, how solid is Harry's resolve to turn her over to the police? Questions possibilities. We shall weigh them all when I return shortly with Act Three. How does it begin? Where does it begin? Why does it begin? A man spends his years walking what we are pleased to call the straight and narrow and suddenly he finds himself sorely tempted to break out of the social and religious mold he has formed for himself over the course of a lifetime. There are those who say man is naturally evil, and there are those who say that man is intrinsically good. Well, Harry Johnson can be a test case for either point of view. Here we are. Yes. Here we are. At the police station. Do your duty, Mr. Harry Johnson. Do your duty as an upright, dedicated, concerned citizen. I will. Let's go. Oh? Well, sure. Send him in. Mr. Johnson. And Miss Sloan. Well, won't you both sit down? Well... What can I do for you? Lieutenant Craven. By the way, I was going to go to that banquet the other night, Mr. Johnson, but I was on the desk. Somebody has to mind the store. Uh, yeah, that's right. Congratulations. Everybody says, for once, the man of the year committee picked the right guy. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, well, now, what can your police department do for you folks? Uh, Lieutenant, I am here to report... Yes, sir? I I wish to report that... Uh... That Miss Wilma Sloan... Well, uh, hold it just a second. I didn't think I'd have to write anything down. Let me get my pad here. Okay. Shoot. I have to report that Miss Wilma Sloan... That's uh, Sloan spelled with an E at the end, right? That's right. We had some Sloans over to North Gap, but they don't have the E. So you wouldn't be related, I suppose. I don't suppose so. You were saying, Mr. Johnson, about Miss Sloan? I wish to report that, that I... Say, you sound like it's something serious. Well, I... I... Look, you see, uh, uh, Miss Sloan here is... Well, she, she's a... Yeah? She's a... She, she, she's a very shy and timid person, and... Well, she happened to be talking to my wife, and she she said she couldn't be sure, but she thought she might have noticed some uh, uh, some prowlers about the vicinity of her home. Well, I said, why don't you notify the police? And she said she didn't want to bother anyone. Oh, now, Miss Sloan. Bother us? <laughs> Please bother us. That's why we're here to be bothered. And so I said, nonsense. I'll take it up with my friend, uh, Lieutenant Craig. You're absolutely right, Mr. Johnson. Miss Sloan, any time you have the slightest, the vaguest suspicion, you get on that phone. You understand? Yes, Lieutenant. Mr. Johnson, if there were more people like you, how much easier our job would be. Thanks for the lift. Won't you come in? You know, you haven't said a word since we left the police station. I know. Good night. Good night? Just like that? No. Not just like that. I suppose... I suppose you should know why I did it. But I do know. It's not at all what you're thinking. It isn't? I thought about it. I kept thinking about what you had done. You killed a man who... Well, who had behaved badly towards you. After all, he was married and he... Well, he had no right... 
Well, you were sentenced to prison. You had already served two years. Please. It isn't as if you're a professional killer. You won't do it again. You've been frightened enough, punished enough. In jail, you'd be a burden on society. Here, you're... Well, you're an asset to the community. You're productive. Harry, you're... you can kiss me. I'm doing this because... Because I think no useful purpose would be served. Harry, why don't you kiss me? You wanted to kiss me since you first saw me in that courtroom. I... I... Harry, kiss me. <sighs> Wilma. Hello, Jenny. Where were you? Harry, you're home. Of course I'm home. Well... I figured the PTA committee meeting should be over by 10.30, so I thought I'd surprise you and stop by. We could go somewhere and have a sandwich. Oh, was I hungry. I'm sorry. But the school was dark. I guess the meeting ended early. Well, no. As a matter of fact, it, uh, it never began. Oh? What do you mean? Well, there was no meeting. It was, that was the wrong night. Oh. Well, what did you do? Oh, I figured since I was out anyway, I'd, uh, oh, I'd pay old Jerry Phelan a visit. Jerry Phelan? Yes, you remember Jerry. He ran the newsstand near the railroad station since, well, I guess it must be the Civil War or something like that. Oh. Well, you see, now he's laid up sick. Everybody's forgotten him, and, well, he lives near the school. Oh, darling, that was very thoughtful and very sweet. Incidentally, dear, are you free Wednesday night? Well, well, sure. Why do you ask? Well, you do have a great many demands on your time. Do I? Well, yes, I suppose I do. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the way you ask that question. What do you mean? Are you free Wednesday night? A woman shouldn't have to talk that way to her own husband. Oh, Harry, you are the kind of a man who has to keep active working for the community. And, well, I don't mind at all. You don't? No. Because, darling, it's the thing you need. You have to do it. You need fulfillment. It makes you a better man. And a better husband. You know, Jenny, I... I never realized what a remarkable woman you are. Oh, thank you, kind sir. Why don't we go out now to have a snack somewhere? No, Harry, it's too late. Wednesday night. I... I have to go. So soon? It's close to 11. I suppose so. But I'll see you tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Oh. Well, tomorrow's Wednesday, isn't it? Well, we, we can't see each other. Why not? Well, because... Well, because Jenny has something planned. Jenny? She's my wife, Wilma. And what am I? Wilma, I... Oh, poor Harry. You can never face reality. You are terrified by the facts. Wilma, I have to go now. To Jenny. Of course. As we both know, she is my wife. Because she has the document. <laughs> the document. That's how Mrs. Coyne expressed it at the trial. She has the document. Oh, Harry. Who has your heart? Oh, Wilma. I'll give you a call tomorrow for Thursday. Harry, won't you answer the question? <laughs> no, I guess not. Because once you face up to that question, you'll have to accept the next step. You'll have to divorce Jenny. Divorce Jenny? Well, a man in my position doesn't divorce. Oh, I see. Your position doesn't divorce. How about you? Well, I could never do it. I could never... You're going home to her now. But answer this. Would you rather be alone with her? Or would you rather be alone with me? Well, Pete, it's about time for the dessert. And I always skip mine. So, suppose we stop talking about sports and politics. And you tell me why you wanted to buy my lunch. A couple of months ago, I warned you, Harry. About what? I warned you not to have an affair with Wilma Sloan. Now, Pete. Harry, I, uh, I spoke with Lieutenant Craven of the police department. Oh, Lieutenant Craven? Or rather, he spoke with me. I will say he was embarrassed. What does Lieutenant Craven have to do with... Some time ago, you brought Wilma in to see him. It seems that she... She was too bashful to complain about prowlers in her neighborhood. Oh, yes? Yes. So, Craven's had a squad car cruising the area. And the patrolman noticed a man who keeps coming and going. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, Craven's a good friend of mine. 
And he's put two and two together. What right does he have? Come on, Jerry, come on. Craven worships the ground you walk on. He thinks you should be president. He's afraid if this gets out, and this kind of thing always does, you'll become a laughing stock. A guy like you, Mr. Morality himself, why people will eat this up. I... Oh, Pete. I... I don't know what to do. Okay, let's break it down. You in love with her? I don't know. Will you divorce Jenny? I don't want to. Harry. Harry. Break it up now. Before it goes too far. Walk away. Because after a while, she won't let you. What? What do you mean? It's in her eyes. Those brilliant eyes. There's something sharp like steel. To get what she wants, she'll do anything. She's the kind who could kill you. Oh, that's ridiculous. Harry... Harry, you've been married 15 years. I, I, I don't say this because she's my sister, but she's a girl in a million, Jenny is, and you know it. Pete, Pete, it's like... It's like an illness. I know, I know. I've been there before. But you can't end every illness by letting it run its course because that way you take the chance it'll kill you. Harry, cure it. I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to or you don't want to? But uh, look, your life's in a mess right now. Go away for a week. Go away? How? Oh, come on. A guy in your position can suddenly realize he has to make a business trip. Get away from both of them and think out your problem. Decide what's important. Make up your mind. What do you really want? Hi, darling. Hello, Wilbur. Well, Hello. Is that all you can say? It's been over a week. Come on, sit down. Dinner's ready. I'm just carving the roast. Wilma. Wilma. It's time we had a serious talk. I know, darling. We're overdue. Oh, Wilma. You can trust me. Trust you? Of course I trust you. No. No, not really. What are you saying? You didn't want to go back to prison. Now, that's true, isn't it? That's true, but... No, no, no. Now, please listen. So you don't have to pretend any longer. Pretend what? Pretend that you love me. Hey, I'm not pretending. That night, that first night, you said to me that my silence was the most important thing in the world and that you were willing to buy it. Now, you said that. Yes, I said that. Well, you don't have to buy it any longer. Not that you ever had to buy it in the first place. So you thought... I was buying you. You admitted it. You forget what else I told you that same night. I said it's not how these things begin, but what they become. And ours has become love. I love my wife. Now, look, this is over. It's come to an end. It's not over. It's just begun. I won't let you walk out on me. We both knew it would have to end sometime. It can only end when one of us is dead. Oh, Wilma, don't be stupid. My name isn't Wilma. Why do you call me Wilma? Because, because, oh, Good Lord, this is the way it happened before. The way... Yes, it has happened before, hasn't it? Oh, hasn't it, Charlie? Please, control yourself, Wilma. You know my name isn't Wilma, it's Tessie. Was that her name? Was that her name, Charlie? I'm not Charlie Reynolds or Ryan. I'm Harry, Harry Johnson, and you're safe. Your secret is safe with me. If I can't have you, she can't have you. Be sensible. A woman in love is never sensible. Don't be crazy. If I can't have you, no one can have you. You're mad. Put down that knife. I will kill you. Oh, Wilma. My name is Daddy. Wilma. Ah. 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 Wilma. Oh. I told you no one else can ever have you. <coughs> no one else can ever have you. Sloan, Tessie Bonner, Charlie Reynolds, Harry Johnson. So many times, in so many places, they act and reenact the same roles, over and over again. And it's a mixture of love, deceit, madness, and evil. And to taste it is to risk the arrival of death. But you shall risk nothing if you wait for me to arrive after a few moments. And so, what is it? What is evil? 
Need it be nurtured carefully before it springs forth from the human breast? Or can it be a sudden thing? An alien thing? Our cast included Norman Rose, Terry Keene, Joan Shea, Nat Poland, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's W.R. Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is W.O.R. New York and RKO General Station. At the time signal, exactly 8 o'clock, here's John Scott with the news.